Go. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Kim Haber, president of Sisterhood of Temple Beth Shalom. And I just wanted to say a big hello to all my sisters from Temple Beth Shalom, the WRJ Southeast District, sisterhoods throughout Miami, the Miami Beach JCC, and even Temple Israel in Akron, Ohio. It's so wonderful that we could all be here together this morning. I was speaking to Cantor Lisa Siegel this morning, and she explained that this upcoming week's Torah portion, we're gonna find out that Balak, the king of Moab, hires a pagan prophet, Balaam, to curse the Israelites. No surprise. Three times Balaam opens his mouth to curse the Israelites, and three times God turns those curses into blessings. Among the three blessings are the words, Ma tovu o ha lecha, how good are your tents, O Jacob, your dwelling place. This prayer has come to serve as a proclamation of great blessings received when a community gathers together. And even with all that's going on around us, Books and Books is assisting us in finding creative ways for our community to gather and be together and to get to meet Jennifer Weiner, who is a number one New York Times bestselling author of 17 books. Her latest book is Big Summer, which you will be receiving in the mail very soon. And she is also a contributing opinion writer in the New York Times. And if you haven't had an opportunity to read her columns, you can find some on her website, jenniferweiner.com. They are fabulous. We are lucky today to have a fantastic interviewer, Katie Kempner, who is a creator and host of Perspectives with Katie Kempner, which is a long running series of conversations with remarkable working women balancing their busy lives. Katie is also the founder of Kempner Communication, a high-end business communication consultancy based in Miami, Los Angeles, and New York. And the one thing that she didn't include on her bio is that she's also my best friend. Throughout the event, you're welcome to ask questions in the chat and Katie will leave some time to share and ask with Jennifer. So it is my pleasure to welcome Katie Kempner and Jennifer Weiner. Hi. Hello. How are you? This is so exciting. I'm so glad to be here. You have no idea. This is wonderful. Good morning, everyone. Well, thank you for doing this. And I don't want to waste a minute of time. So let us start by talking about your new book, Big Summer. <laughs> yes. Tell us a little bit about it. So Big Summer is the story of Daphne Berg. Daphne is a 28-year-old New Yorker who is, like many women in their 20s, she's trying to figure it out, trying to put her life back together after this moment of viral humiliation. Um, it's, a, it's a very modern kind of shaming that she goes through. And she decides that instead of being embarrassed, she's going to kind of steer into the skid. She reinvents herself as a plus size Instagram influencer. And things are going pretty well. You know, she's still working as a babysitter to make some money and her dog still has more followers on social media than she does. But things are, things are trending upward. And then back into her life comes Drew Kavanaugh, who was her best friend frenemy all through elementary school and high school. And um, it was a toxic friendship. There was a lot of um, envy and mistrust and betrayal, but there's also a great deal of love and affection and history that these two women have. Drew shows up because she wants Daphne to be in her wedding. She's getting married on Cape Cod. She says, you are the best friend I ever had. I can't imagine getting married without you. And Daphne, in spite of her better instincts, agrees to do this. And so off we go to the Outer Cape, which is one of the most beautiful places in the world. And I love being there and I loved writing about it. And the wedding takes a turn which I think is all I can say without giving too much away. And Daphne ends up having to solve a crime and having to really investigate who this friend was, not the, not the life that she was sort of perpetrating on Instagram, but the truth of her existence. 
and also kind of chart her own course in relationship to what she learns. So it's a mystery, it's a wedding story, it's a story about friendship, it's got some real estate porn and some delicious food descriptions. And, you know, I wrote it just to be a really fun summer read before I knew what this summer was going to be like, obviously. Well, I can attest to the fact that it is, I told you I, uh, I had pre-ordered this book because I couldn't wait and it does not disappoint. It's really a lot of fun. Thank you. I wanted to ask you, you, you know, I've seen that you've written in your, some of your opinion pieces for the New York Times about influencer culture and you made the main character an influencer. You mentioned Drew, one of the characters in the book, and she's very, you know, taking so great pains, like many people, to portray this terrific life, which may not exactly be accurate. Right. Talk a little bit about influencer culture and your thoughts on it. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts about social media and about influencer culture. And I, you know, I, I think I read somewhere that like we're the last generation that's going to be able to remember being adults before the internet happened. You know, like I, my first book came out in 2001 and I remember like building that very first website and then like telling my publisher that I wanted to have a blog and hearing what is a blog. So I feel like in a way I've come of age with the internet and with social media and I've seen all of the platforms kind of rise and fall starting with MySpace where I think I maybe still have a profile because I never turned it off but I was there. I was on Facebook, I was on Twitter, I was on Instagram and I've sort of seen all of these you know, watched people try to figure out how to use these tools because they are tools. And like any tool, you can use them to build or you can use them to destroy. And the other piece of it is that I have daughters now. And I, you know, every time one of their schools has, like they bring in some expert to talk about online bullying or how to keep your kids safe or how to, you know, help your kids navigate social media. Like I'm always like sitting in the front row taking notes because I don't know. I don't know what the right thing is. And, you know, I've watched all of it. Like, you know, I remember when I was a kid, you would go to school Monday morning and you would hear about the party that you didn't get invited to and how much fun everybody had without you. And I feel like for my daughters, they now get to see that party happening in real time on TikTok or on Snapchat. And it's just like this new level of, of pain and exclusion. Um, but I've also seen both of my daughters connect to people who they wouldn't ever meet in the real world and sort of find people who are interested in what they're interested in, whether it's, you know, comic books or Broadway or anime or whatever, whatever they want. You know, there, there are people and you can find a community. So those were some of the things that I wanted to have Daphne, my, my heroine in Big Summer, navigate. On the one hand, Instagram lets her find her people. It lets her find community. It lets her make some money. But on the other hand, there are trolls. And, you know, if you're a woman on the internet, you've probably met a few of them. And there's also this idea that, like, the internet is making all of us lead double lives. You know, there's the real mess that I'm not going to show you, you know, the dishes in the sink and the clothes on the floor and the fight that I had with my kid. And then there's the beautiful pictures that I'm going to put on Instagram of, you know, the lovely challah that I just baked or look at my children or, you know, my great vacation. And it, it really, you know, it does something to you. It does something when you see all of those stories. It does something when you yourself have to decide, like, what am I going to put out there? How am I going to present it? How do I filter? How do I crop? What do I share? What do I not share? I mean, it's it's a whole, you know, I, I could I think I could write like novels forever just about social media, but I won't. <laughs> Maybe another at some point. Maybe a couple more, right? <laughs> well, I mean, you're an influencer yourself. And back several years ago in 2016, you were responsible for We Are the Swimsuit Movement. Yes. And yes. It, I'd love for you to talk about that because I also think in terms of having daughters, another right. thing has to, you know, so much on the, you know, on social media is what you look like. 
Yes. So one of the things that I have found really delightful about social media is the body positivity movement and the way that you can see all kinds of bodies, all kinds of women, all ages, all races, all ethnicities, just out there in the world living their lives in a way that I think does a really healthy thing in terms of normalizing like, okay, this is what a female body can look like. This is like a range of healthy bodies because, you know, I tell my kids all the time when I was growing up, the only fat women that I ever saw in the media were either like the punchlines of the joke or the funny best friend, the funny sexless best friend, or they were the before in the weight loss ads, you know, like that was the only representation of larger bodies that my generation had. And, you know, I think back to Carney Wilson from Wilson Phillips and every time they would have a video, it was like, you would see the beautiful slender girls, you know, you'd see China Phillips and you'd see Michelle Williams and then you'd see Carney like hiding behind a boulder or like a grand piano that was somehow on a beach because they had to like give her something to be behind because God forbid you see a size 16 woman just out there in the world. So that's changed and that's something that social media has really been a part of changing. And in 2016, I got this really cute bathing suit and I was trying it on and I was thinking of the years after my daughter was born when like there are, there's this span of time where like you see the pictures where I'm bringing her home from the hospital and then you see the pictures from her baby naming and then you see the pictures from her first birthday and in between those events, it's like I have ceased to exist because I'm not in any of the pictures because I didn't want to be in any of the pictures because I was uncomfortable with the way that I looked, which, you know, is something that all of us grapple with, but it left this kind of incomplete record of my daughter's life where like, she's looking back at these pictures and she's like, where were you? Like, did, did you move out or something? Like what's going on here? And I thought like, this is so silly. Like I missed out on so much just because of my own insecurities. And I know that I'm not the only one who won't be in pictures or who won't take her cover up off or who won't even put on a bathing suit and just get in the water with her kids and enjoy that moment. So I went up on my roof deck and I had my husband take my picture, you know, in my cute size 16 bathing suit. And I posted it on Facebook and I said, this is the bathing suit I'm going to be wearing this summer and I'm going to be in the water and I'm going to be with my children. And I hope that you will be too. hashtag wear the swimsuit. And it just turned into this thing. And it was so wonderful to see all of these women sharing their pictures and, and seeing each other and then being able to say like, oh, wow, like I'm not the only one with like wobbly bits or, or stretch marks or scars or whatever it is that you're feeling insecure about. And all of us have a right to be out there in the world. It's not just for the young and the thin. And, and that's a great message. And it's a message that you can really find amplified and repeated on social media. And one of the things that I learned as I was researching this book is that our brains process visual information differently than they do like facts and figures, you know, like I could show you a chart of information and you would read it and you would understand it. But the parts of our brains that understand that take in visual information, it's like a much older part of our brain and, and thus a much more efficient part of our brain. So the idea that you can go online and see those women that has meaning. And I think that that's like a really wonderful thing that the internet does. And we lost Katie. Did we lose Katie or is it just- uh -oh, I'm here, I'm here, you're, you're here. here. I can't see you, I can hear you. Oh wait, okay. no, it's me and I'm giant. Oh Lord, that's terrifying. Uh-oh. Now you're, wait, you almost came back. Okay. <laughs> Uh-oh. Now I can't see you. Okay, now can we see each okay. other? I cannot see you, but ask me a question, okay? Because I can okay. hear you. I'll ask you a question. Can you hear me? Yes, can I you, can hear you. Me, I, I can kick you off and bring you back on, okay? Let's try that for a second. See if that okay. works. Okay. Hang on. 
Well, as we're waiting, um, and this is, believe me, this is the least of the technical difficulties that I have experienced on my virtual book tour. I made a bingo card for my author friends about like, check off these boxes as things go wrong on your virtual tour. Oh, there you are. And I'm on the other side. So it's like oh a God, little so matchup. Nice. <laughs> like dinner and you switch sides. I love it. <laughs> well, let me jump in and well, would you want to finish what you were saying? Well, yeah, I mean, it was just like I said, like, you know, you won't be able to hear the moderator. The moderator won't be able to hear you. The audience won't be able, able to hear anything. And then I like just jokingly wrote a fire alarm will go off. And then I had that happen at like the Sabasa <laughs> event with like a bajillion people and the fire alarm went off. And I'm like, I, I like spoke that into existence somehow. <laughs> I mean, but it was okay. We got through it. We got, yeah, and we got through this and it might happen mm -hmm. again and it'll be fine. Yeah, you really good. don't need me, I can tell. <laughs> no. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously we, if someone had, if you had written a book where it was like everybody um, in the world is gonna be affected mm -hmm. by a global pandemic, everyone's gonna need to wear a mask, millions of people are gonna die. You might've gone to your publisher and they would have been like, Come on, we do something a little more believable. Exactly. How, how are you coping right now? I think that I am, well, first of all, being an author, it's a very like solitary internal life. And I joke that I've been training my entire life for quarantine because like, I am a homebody and I work at home and like given my druthers, I'd probably like leave the house like a couple times a week, maybe if I was really ambitious. So I personally have been dealing with this okay. I The issue I've been having, and I feel like it's an issue that a lot of women are having is like helping my kids because my daughter is gonna be a senior in high school next year. So she missed out on watching her friends who were seniors graduate. She missed out on, she was gonna do like a summer program in New York City this summer. That's obviously not happening. Um, and my 12 year old was gonna go to sleepaway camp on the Cape. And, you know, we've been like getting her ready for this and like talking it up and it's gonna be great and you're gonna do fine. And we like got her there. And then she was just like, oh, I guess not. And she is like my little social creature. Like she loves people. She's a people person and she loves to talk and she loves to like be with her friends and she can't. And, you know, and again, it's like stupid social media because she's like, I saw my friends on TikTok and they are hanging out. And I'm like, yeah, you can't do that. And she's like, they said that we are at code yellow and they can do this. And I'm like, no, they can't. But it's like, you know, she can see it happening. So it's it's just, I mean, I'm trying as much as I can to help them keep this in perspective. But like when you're only 12 years old, like how much perspective do you have? It's, it's not like this too shall pass. Cause like, as far as she knows, like maybe it won't, like maybe this is just how it's gonna be. Um, you know, and I live in center city, Philadelphia which is hard too, because um, it's, it's crowded and most people are wearing masks, but not everybody is. And I haven't seen any like drama that, that's that been going around online of like people, you know, claiming that their civil rights are being infringed upon because they can't get a latte at Starbucks with no mask on. But, you know, I just feel like we're a powder keg right now. And, you know, we had protests and we had demonstrations and they're ongoing and mostly peaceful. But I mean, it's a whole lot. And I, I wish I could give you guys like some secrets, but I really don't have any. I, I think I'm just doing the best I can like everyone else. Well, you and I shared one thing, which is we both turned 50 in this shelter <laughs> thing. <laughs> 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 How's, I mean, how's 50 treating you? How did you celebrate, you know? So we were gonna go to like the, you know, the place for dinner in Philadelphia, which is now closed like forever and ever because of the pandemic. So I will never get to go there now. But, you know, my mom and her partner were gonna come and my husband and my kids and I were all just gonna go out and like have this like fabulous dinner. And then my husband and I were gonna go to Alaska this summer. 
and like take this big trip and like go on the glaciers and go hiking and go kayaking and go whale watching and and um now you know now it's like we're um we're <laughs> we're watching um friday night lights like that's our uh that's our big summer but 50 is crazy like i don't know how you're feeling about it but like i like in my head 50 feels like old lady and I don't feel like an old lady yet. Although then I like look at my hair and I'm like, oh yeah, I guess, <laughs> I guess it's real. I guess it's happening. The gray. Yeah. It, on, on Friday, one of my close friends from college turned 50 and one of our friends got all of, got a whole bunch of women together and we did a surprise zoom and everyone was 50 and we were all saying, oh, uh -huh. we don't feel any different, but we right? became friends 32 years ago. So. I mean, I, I sort of still feel like I'm 28. Like, I feel like that's where I stopped somehow. Like, I'm just like still at that point. Like every once in a while, I like look at my kids and I'm like, they're mine. Like, <laughs> I, it's not like mom and dad are coming and I'm the babysitter who gets to go home. Like, I, I gotta do this whole thing. Like there there is no uh, there is no respite. But so did you have a party? Did, did you do something for your 50th? We were supposed to go to to Napa with Kim, who did the big introduction, and her husband, and several other couples, and we had the most fabulous trip planned. And I've saved the itinerary, um, but we couldn't do any of it. So we celebrated yeah, at home, and it was the first night of Passover, actually. So we uh, had, yeah, it was, but it was, and my parents were going to come down for that. It was right. So all of all of that and a crap birthday cake too, right? Oh, crap birthday cake, yeah. <laughs> no, actually, the birthday cake was good. My my son has taken up baking during this whole thing, so he was able to concoct something with so many sprinkles. It didn't really matter what it even tasted like. That's it was amazing because most Pesadeca desserts are crap. Yes, and so, I mean, so I I bake challah, and I've been doing it like. Oh. On Shabbat and like doing it on Facebook Live and people hang out with me. But then it was Passover, so I decided to make matzah, right? Which I'd never done. So I go online and I'm looking at matzah recipes, and it's like matzah with Trader Joe's everything topping, or like whole wheat matzah with whatever. And I'm like, guys, matzah is supposed to taste terrible, right? Like it is the bread of affliction. Like, why are you like doozying it up like this? It's supposed to be awful you're supposed to suffer right like <laughs> i i had a whole thing a whole shtick about matzah but i made it it's it's actually very easy you know as it should be you know when like when the pharaoh is chasing you out of egypt like you better be able to like pull that off quick well you mentioned your you mentioned your hala and um Everybody here, I think you know, got your holla recipe. Yeah. There, are there any tips? Could you kind of take us through anything we should know for when we're making it? Well, the thing I will tell you is that holla is super forgiving. And if you're thinking like, well, I'm not a baker or bread feels like big and challenging, like it really, really isn't. And I mean, it's just... It, it almost always feels like magic to me because it's like flour, oil, eggs, salt, honey. And you just take those things and like a couple hours later, they're like this delicious loaf of bread. It's, it's kind of a small miracle. And the thing that I like about hollow, like it does take time, right? Because you, you make your dough, then you knead it, then it rises for an hour, then you punch it or you get your kid to punch it. Very satisfying, highly recommend. Um, and then it rises again, and then you braid it, and then it does one more slow rise in the refrigerator, very important. But, you know, that's an afternoon. Like, you can't be, like, running around doing a million other things if you've got hollow going on. And I find that for me, on a Friday afternoon, that's how I kind of, like, ramp down from my work week and sort of refocus on, like, food and family and like I'm going to make a nice Shabbat dinner we're going to light the candles we're going to say the blessings like I I think that there's something um really like intuitive about the process and doing it on Shabbat and the way that it kind of takes you from work to rest so that is what I would say about challah but it doesn't have to be that deep it could just be a nice loaf of bread 
Or it could be that deep or somewhere in or the middle. Hey, I'm, the, I'm the daughter of a philosopher. Everything is deep on some right. level. So I'm the daughter of a psychiatrist. So everything goes back to your childhood. And my grandfather was a psychiatrist. So it's like very, right, your childhood Whoa. and very heavy conversations in the Kemper family. But let's talk a little bit more about Judaism because we are, you know, talking to a bunch of amazing Jewish women. So besides Shabbat dinner, what role does Judaism play in your life? I mean, it's it's hard to think of a piece of my life that hasn't been inflected by my Judaism. So I grew up in a small town in Connecticut where there were very, very few Jewish families. Like in my high school class of 400, I think there were like 10 or 11 of us who were Jewish. And I always felt like an outsider, um, you know, in part because I was just like super nerdy and I had like a gigantic vocabulary and no social skills, which was probably the main issue. But, you know, this was sort of, back in the day where like you would sing Christmas carols in chorus and you would make Christmas ornaments in art class. And it was just like, it was very, very, you know, that was the majority and you were the minority and nobody was sort of trying to make exceptions or like, you know, I, I think they'd like throw in like one Hanukkah song at the assembly and, and you'd be lucky to have it. And it was always dreidel, dreidel, dreidel. But, you know, so I, I always sort of felt myself to be a little bit on the outside, but I think that what that does is it. Uh oh. Let's see. Now you're frozen. I don't know if you're just frozen for me or for everyone. We're having a little technical difficulty, and I don't have any good stories. I'm, I'm oh. bringing her right back on. Hang on. Perfect. I'll just hold Thank up the book again. Yes, hold please. Okay. You're back. You're gone now. Well, we can't see her. Yep. Can we hear you? Nope. Christina, maybe you should do that same thing and I'm trying. Oh, okay. <laughs> There I'm back. Perfect. <laughs> um, you know, so I'm raising my daughters in a very Jewish household and my 17 year old was bat mitzvah. My 12 year old is scheduled to be bat mitzvah in December. She is asking every day. She's like, do you think it will be canceled? I'm like, nope, do your studying. <laughs> I think she's thinking like, oh, this is gonna like get her off the hook, but I'm like, no ma'am. Like, you know, so, but I, I you know, I believe in the teachings of Judaism. I believe in tikkun olam. Like that's the piece of Judaism that I think resonates with me the most deeply is the idea that like all of us have an obligation to repair the broken world. And I think that like in my own small way, telling stories that entertain people, that maybe make them think, that maybe open their eyes to something they haven't thought about. I feel like that's my piece of it. And speaking up when I see unfairness, when I see sexism, um, you know, and just trying to help li women live their lives more completely and more authentically. To the extent that I'm doing that, I think that's what I'm here to do. That's wonderful. Um, well, in that vein, I mm -hmm. think um, you live in Philadelphia. You mentioned the riots there. In this time right now, there'd be no, you know, and people can't not talk about everything that's going on in the world. And one of the main things that's going on is the Black Lives Matter movement. Yes. And I know you've spoke, you've written about it and have some strong feelings about it. A lot of businesses have now sprung very quickly to making these big proclamations of what they're planning on doing, which will be amazing if it happens. But there are so many levels to this. Can, can you talk a little bit about your feelings on it? 
Yeah, I mean, it's there's a piece in the Sunday Times that I'm going to link to on my Facebook page and that I'd really recommend to everyone. And it's it's called What We Are Owed. And it it's all about sort of the whole experience of being Black in America from the Emancipation Proclamation to the present day and all of the ways that the system was sort of set up to privilege white people and make it much easier for us to accumulate the kind of generational wealth that lets each successive generation do better than the one before it. Like I think about my grandparents had high school education and my parents went to college, went to graduate school, got graduate degrees, and my siblings and I, you know, all college graduates, all professionals. And I think about what made that possible. And, you know, the fact that when my father came out of the army, he was able to get a loan, you know, and to move into a house in a nice neighborhood that both of those are things that maybe a black family would not have had access to. And I think about, you know, all of the privileges that I've enjoyed and all of the things that I was taught, which is, you know, treat people fairly, treat everyone the same, you know, we're all the same underneath our skin and how that's not a very useful thing to tell a kid. And, you know, I try to really think about what am I telling my children about race? What am I teaching them about race? And and having those conversations affirmatively, because it shouldn't just be black people who are talking about this. You know, my kids have to see, you know, all of the ways that the world was unfair, all of the ways that the world needs to change, and all of the obligations that they have as privileged young women whose voices are always going to be heard somehow, you know, and I'm thinking a lot about like how lucky I've been in my career. Um, you know, publishing is dominated by women. There's a lot of Jewish women who've been very successful sort of rising through the ranks at publishing houses and just thinking about like, okay, now that I'm a successful novelist, now that I get, you know, nice advances for my books, like what is required of me at this moment to uplift other voices. How do I share my platform? How do I pass the mic? How do I use my money and my voice and my privilege and my platform and all of those things to amplify voices of people who didn't have the advantages that I've had? And I'm thinking about it a lot. And I, I don't know what the answers are because it's easy to say, as many corporations have, you know, we're going to do better. We believe that Black Lives Matter. Well, of course, you know, it's easy to say, I believe that. But, you know, what does your boardroom look like? What does your masthead look like? You know, who's working on your projects? Who are the people at the top? And how many of them are people of color? And how do you change that? And these are things that I'm really thinking about because I want to have goals that are specific and attainable and measurable. And I want to be accountable. You know, I want to say like, here's what I want to do and have people be able to hold me accountable. So there yeah. it is. I think you're absolutely right. So it, with my firm, we represent, we're a communications firm and we represent a number of advertising agencies. And it's been really, really exciting to see these agencies start putting things into place about their hiring practices and everything like that, but also about how they're gonna cast and represent people in, in commercials and advertising, because it has to be like from every different way in, you know, the yes. The, everything that you see has to be more inclusive and make more sense and be representative of what the world is like. That's absolutely true. And representation matters so much. And there's been a lot written. And if you go looking for it, you can find it about like children's literature and how how 
so many of those books continue to center not just white people, but white boys. You know, it's like boys read about boys, girls read about boys, everybody has to read about white people. And it's like, you know, how are we going to change that? How are we going to make it a bigger tent and welcome more voices in and have all of those books available to all of our children? So that's one thing that I've been doing actually is um, going to donorschoose.org and finding classrooms that are trying to build their class libraries to include more books that are by black people, by writers of color, about black kids and just, you know, throw them some money. That's an easy thing to do. And it's a, it's an impactful thing to do. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking to make a difference, I would donorschoose.org. So I have two more things I want to ask you, and I want to encourage everybody to ask some questions, and then I will read them and ask them to you. So one awesome. thing, I mean, just sort of on a lighter note, and you mentioned that, you know, in terms of quarantine, because writing is a solitary process, what is the process? You know, how do you, how do you go from having an idea to, for a book to, to this? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's it's a whole lot of putting your butt in the seat, confronting that blank page and getting some words down every single day. And I think a lot of times that the difference between people who actually write books and people who are like, oh, I've got a great idea for a book and I'm going to write it someday. I, I'm going to do it. It's just putting your butt in the seat and making yourself type some words, right? And and doing it every single day, making it a habit, like making it a muscle memory thing. So I'm very lucky. Like I love to write. I'm I'm not one of these writers who finds it like miserable torture. Like I really enjoy what I do. So that's half the battle. But the other half of it is before I was a novelist, I was a journalist and I worked for a small local newspaper for a while and then a medium sized local newspaper in Lexington, Kentucky, where I lived. And there are Jews there. I dated them both. Um, <laughs> and, right. And then I worked for the Philadelphia Inquirer before I published my first novel. And when you work for newspapers like you do not have the luxury of writer's block. You cannot tell your editor, like, I'm sorry, I know I was supposed to write you a 12 inch story about the sewage board hearing, but my muse has not spoken to me, right? Like your editor does not care about your muse and, and you and your muse will be unemployed. So I really learned good habits. I learned to be productive. I learned how to write even when I didn't feel like writing, you know, just put yourself in the seat and make yourself do it. And I write um, mornings, sort of late morning into early afternoon. Like I get up, I walk the dog with my husband, I talk. He's a, a writer and an editor, so he's great to talk to. I do some exercise because if I don't do it first thing, it's not happening. Um, you know, and then I come home and I take a shower and I deal with my email and I check social media. And then usually from like 11 to, or noon to like three or four, I am sitting at my desk in my closet where I work and I, I write and I'm very, very happy. And that's how you do it. Sort of one word at a time, one page at a time. So did I hear you right? You write in your closet? I write in my closet. Okay, so I live in this house that has this ridiculous closet. It's like the Sex in the City to Carrie Bradshaw, the, the closet that Big gave Carrie. That is the closet that I have in this house. However, I do not have a Carrie Bradshaw wardrobe or a Carrie Bradshaw shoe collection. So I've turned this closet into like an office slash library slash storage facility. You know, my clothes are there and then clothes that my older daughter has outgrown that the younger daughter is going to get someday. They're there. I have a lot of books there because I have a lot of books everywhere. And then I, I sit and type at the vanity where a fancy lady would do her makeup. That is where I write my books. So I call it I call it a clothis, which is a word, the closet office. It's a clothis. But what you're seeing right now, this is this is my assistant's office that I have uh, taken over for the duration. Got it. Well, I want to just ask you one final question, of which course. was 
is there, and then we'll open it up. I see a bunch of them coming. Um, is there one piece of advice that has helped guide you through your life and your career that you could share with us? You know, somebody once asked, like, what is the best piece of advice your mother ever gave you? And all I could think of was don't pick it, which she used to say when I would like break out as a teenager, like don't pick your face. But that's not really useful life advice. So, I mean, <laughs> God, what would I say? Like, just, you know, there's only one you. So don't try to be like anybody else. Don't copy anyone. Don't imitate anyone. Be authentically yourself. Be the best version of you that you can be. And be kind. You know, that is what I tell my kids. So that is that is what I would leave you with. That's my advice. That is fantastic advice. <laughs> wow. Let's see. What else do we have here? This person's, okay. Oh, Anna Saruski, whose husband helped me design this beautiful built-in behind me, which I That's just got gorgeous. done. I've been admiring it all morning. It's beautiful. Thank you. It's very exciting. This is my new office, which is not a closet. It's actually pretty small, though, but you can only see this part. So Anna says, I've read all your books and have loved them all. My daughter is an aspiring writer attending Sarah Lawrence College. What Ooh. suggestions do you have for young writers getting started now? Wow, that is a great question. Sarah Lawrence is a great school. Um, I think I'm going to be visiting it at some point with my daughter. OK, so. I used to tell young writers to go get a job at a small daily newspaper because you will learn discipline and you'll learn how to be observant. You'll learn to look for details. You'll learn to write every day. Journalism is in trouble, though, as I think anyone who's paying attention can tell you. And I am not sure that I would tell somebody to go get a job at a newspaper anymore. I think like those jobs are now like go get an internship at BuzzFeed or something like that. Um, honestly, though, the best advice that I have, I would say two things. If you want to be a writer, you have to be a reader. And I was always a reader. I read everything I could get my hands on. I was an English major in college. I read, you know, the classics and commercial fiction and my father's medical textbooks and cereal boxes, like just anything I could read, I would read. So read as much as you can. And then I would say, get in the habit of writing every day, you know, and if you skip the weekends, that is fine. But you want to teach yourself to you want to give your body those cues, right? Like when I'm in this chair, when I'm in this space, when I'm looking at this blank page, that is when I want the creative part of my mind to kick in and turn on. And I think the more you practice that, even if you're just like writing in a journal or you're writing like a paragraph or two about what you did that day, or you're writing a letter to someone, whether you send it or not, mm -hmm. I think you got to practice. You know, it's the 10,000 hour thing. And when I published my first novel, I actually like went through and sort of added up the years that I'd been writing as a journalist and publishing short stories and writing freelance pieces and magazines, and it kind of was pretty close to 10,000 hours. So start that now. That's what I'd say. Well, the middle part of your question perfectly segues into Lisa Nelson's question, which is, what are you reading now? Oh, my gosh, Lisa, that is a great question. So I am reading Rupi, Rupi Thorpe's novel, The Knockout Artist, which I just started. Um, and I it's about a young a young gay man and a troubled teenage girl. That's all I got so far. I'm only beginning it, but it's wonderful thus far. And this summer, I loved my friend Curtis Sittenfeld's book, Rodham, which was a retelling of Hillary Clinton's life if she didn't marry Bill. So not a retelling, like more of an invention, but like it was about destiny and fate and misogyny and politics. And it was wonderful. And I cannot recommend it highly enough. Well, Cantor Lisa Siegel wants you to know that they had a wonder, she had a wonderful national Cantor's conference a few years ago in Philly that she attended. So she's a fan of Philly. 
But the question she has is how does your, we talked about your Jewish upbringing, but how does it affect your writing in terms of topics and characters? Well, I believe that you write what you know. And so a lot of my heroines have been Jewish and have had Judaism in their lives sort of braided into those stories. You'll read about, you know, a Shiva call or a Passover Seder or someone will say something in Yiddish. Like it's just there as part of the fabric of, of who they are. And for my Jewish readers, <laughs> that feels like really familiar and really like welcoming. And, you know, mm -hmm. I always love it when I can tell that something is sort of like authentically Jewish in a piece of fiction. Susan Isaacs is one of my favorite writers and she writes about Judaism in a really funny and wonderful way. So there's people who can really relate to it. And then there are people who are not Jewish who maybe don't know a lot of Jewish people. And for those people, it's like, it's sort of like what it is for me, like reading Jhumpa Lahiri's books. It's like, oh, this is really interesting. Like this is not a culture that I know about, but I'm really interested in reading about their foods and their rituals and their holidays and their celebrations. So, but yeah, I mean, Judaism is so, it's so integral to who I am that it ends up being very central to who my heroines are. Interesting. So this is from Rachel R. And I have a feeling I know which Rachel this is. Um, she says, I'm new to you. So I'm wondering which is your favorite book for folks to start with? Now, oh. obviously, I don't know if we're, since we're talking about Big Summer, if you'd like to uh -huh. say another favorite book. But I mean, um, Big Summer is a good place to start. It's not a book that you have to have read something else to understand it. So that's a great place to dive right in. Um, if you are looking for something, you know, a summer read with a little bit of meat on its bones, I would steer you toward Mrs. Everything, which is the book that I published in 2019. And it's about um, 70 years of American history as seen through the lives of two Jewish sisters from Detroit. And it, it's sort of much like Rodham is an invention loosely based on Hillary Clinton's life, Mrs. Everything is an invention that is loosely based on my own mother's life, my own mom, who was a Jewish girl from Detroit. So that I would recommend. Um, and if you just want something kind of fun and um, fast moving, Good in Bed, my very first book, which is going to be celebrating its 20th anniversary next year, Mind Blown. Um, that's, that would be a fun one. I would, I would steer you there too. So those are the two. And that was my friend, Rachel Ron from LA who got up early. Oh, to watch. Rachel. <laughs> Thank you. That is so nice. So I, I just have to tell you this one funny little thing, and then we'll go to the next question, which is um, what I told my father, the philosopher that, um, I was going to be doing this. He said, oh yes, isn't that that, he has a terrific memory. When I, I usually travel very often to New York and some other places for business and, and I would always see my dad whenever I could, temporarily on, temporarily on hold. And we were in Barnes and Noble once meeting before I had to go to some business event and you were giving a book reading right at the beginning of your career. And my dad said, wasn't that that author that you wanted to stay for the book reading? It was in the oh. Time Warner Center. I think, I don't know if you did a book reading that, but I think it might've been your very first book. That sounds very familiar. So yes. Wow. <laughs> I mean, wow. I, it probably wasn't my first book because I will tell you at my first book, I did readings to empty rooms and to like, they would set up like 10 chairs and it would be like the bookstore manager and then like a homeless person who'd come for the free cheese and crackers. So maybe there was a couple book, books in when they were sending me to the Time Warner Center, but thank you for wanting to stay. <laughs> Oh, and this one is uh, actually from Martha Kempner, who happens to be my sister, who is also a writer, by the way, but oh, of yeah. nonfiction. Um, how do you approach research for books like Mrs. Everything and get into the minds of so many characters from different time periods? That is a great question. Um, part of it is just imagination. It's just really thinking deeply about who somebody is 
and what their life has been like and how they feel and how they're going to react to whatever events the plot is going to throw at them. The other piece is God bless the internet. Like, I don't know how authors like did it before the internet, but like for Mrs. Everything, for example, where I was writing about women who grew up in, in a different time, lived through different things in, in cities where I'd never lived. I got myself an online subscription to the Detroit Free Press and I would go back and I'd read the paper just the way they might have and sort of, okay, here's what people were talking about. Um, and then you'd like look at the classified ads and like, oh, here's how much it costs to rent an apartment or here's, you know, you look at the ads from the dress stores and like, here's what people were wearing. and you know, there's so much that's out there. I looked at like old issues of Mademoiselle and 17 from like the 50s and the 60s. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot that's available. And then I actually went to Detroit. I, I flew myself out there. My mom met me and she and I and my daughter Phoebe like spent three days like driving around and taking pictures and going back to the places that she remembered. So, you know, I think it's a lot of those journalism skills, like kicking back in. Um, you, you can do a lot of reading. You can do a lot of just like looking online. And then sometimes you just got to go to a place to see, you know, how the air smells when it's October or what the streets look like at night. That's how I do it. Well, Cantor Lisa Siegel, who is also a nice Jewish girl from Detroit, her words... Um, um, she wants to know something that I think we all are, would be interested in hearing about is, can you talk a little bit about the journey from your book, In Her Shoes, from a book to a movie? Yes. So In Her Shoes was my second book, and it was made into a major motion picture starring Shirley MacLaine and Tony Collette and Cameron Diaz. And a lot of books get optioned, which means some entity, some producer gives you some money, not a lot usually, and they're like, you know, we're, we're going to option this book for 12 months or 18 months and we're going to develop it. And the smart thing to do, and I tell this to all of my writer friends, is take the money, cash the check, and just move on to your next thing, right? Like, do not spend a lot of time thinking about like, oh, what if this happens? And who would I cast? And how would it be? Because like 99 times out of 100, that is that is where the story ends. You know, it gets optioned. And maybe there's a script that gets written and nobody likes the script, or maybe everybody likes the script, but they can't find anybody to star at the right time, or they find somebody to star, but the director that they want is busy, or they get the script and the stars and the director, and then the production company goes out of business. I mean, there's a bajillion things that can disrupt a book's journey from page to screen. So when In Her Shoes was optioned, my brother, Jake, who is a producer, was one of the producers on the movie. And he's like, this is going to happen. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, like, wake me up when, you know, when they start shooting it, because I didn't think it was ever going to happen. I was very, very zen about it. And I'm just like, you go do your thing, you know, and then they found somebody amazing to write an amazing script, which I read. And I'm like, wow, this is this is great, you know still not getting my hopes up. And then it was, it, it just, all of the pieces fell into place. They got the stars, they got Curtis Hansen to direct it. They came and shot it in Philadelphia, which was really amazing because many things that are set in places like Philadelphia are actually shot in Canada because you can save lots of money. You don't have to deal with the union. So I was so sure they were going to like be up in Toronto with like a paper mache Liberty Bell. But they they came here and I got to have a little cameo, which was amazing. I mean, it was an amazing experience and it was it was surreal to have something that you just thought about in your brain actually happening on the screen. It was amazing and delightful and i would love for it to happen again and maybe someday it will but you know I, my job is to write the books and that's that's what i focus on and you know people are always like oh were you thinking of like a movie when you wrote this and i'm like look if i was 
trying to get my books made into movies, I would never write another fat girl because it makes it so much harder because there's like no one to play those parts. Although now there are more people there. there we're finally seeing a little more diversity, but boy, oh boy. I mean, it is, it's like a war, but I had a good experience. So Jennifer, and it, by the way, and it was a terrific movie. If you haven't seen it, it I've seen it several times. It shows up a lot, like, you know, when it you're- does. It does, it does, yes. Jennifer Sturr just wants to know, do you have a favorite character from all the books that you've written? Uh, you know, it's always the person that I'm working on. It, it's always the person with whom I'm spending time. So like Daphne right now sort of, still has my heart because she's the one that I've said goodbye to the most recently. Um, you know, Candy Shapiro, who was in Good in Bed, and you see her again in Certain Girls, she was sort of a version, like a, a very sort of much more quick on her feet, wit-wise version of me when I was that age. So she's someone who's always kind of special to me. But you know, there have been supporting characters who I have written of whom I'm very fond. Um, Mrs. Lefkowitz from In Her Shoes, I adore her. And Janie Siegel from Goodnight Nobody, who's the best friend. Um, Janie Siegel of the Carpet Seagulls, as she always introduces herself, who's this sort of spoiled, useless, rich girl who learns to be useful in the course of the story. So lots of good, lots of good women. Is it hard at the end? This is my question. Is it hard at the end to say goodbye to your people? Yes, it is. I mean, it's like graduating, you know, like you've done your work, you've gotten them through, you know, whatever you were putting them through. And now the journey is over and you have to say goodbye. So maybe it's a little bit like a teacher saying goodbye to a student or like a mother, like dropping a kid off at college, but it's, it's bittersweet because on the one hand, you're not going to see them. On the other hand, you've gotten them, God willing, where they need to be. That makes sense. Well, it seems like this is a perfect last question then, okay. which is for Judy Barreto, which is, are you working on another book? I am. I mean, so what I'm doing right now, I'm finishing the third book in my Littlest Bigfoot trilogy, which is my middle grade um, middle grade books. They're books for eight to 12 year olds. And I'm finally going to finish book three. And then I have a couple of ideas. I'm not sure what, I, I'm not sure what's going to be next, but I definitely like there's, there's the wheels are turning. Well, it has been, I know I speak for everybody and I know Kim has a few words to close everything, but it has been so lovely to talk with you. And let me just, for the final thing, buy extra ones of these for your friends because it is so much fun and it was really a joy. Thank you for your time. You are so welcome, Katie. Thank you. Thank you both so much for an interesting, insightful, and just fun view of Jennifer and, and writing a novel. It was really fabulous. Um, Temple Beth Shalom Sisterhood also wants to thank Books and Books for your assistance in making this morning happen. Mitchell Kaplan, Christina Nosti, Carolyn McGregor, Aaron Curtis, and Stephanie Fernandez are all wonderful professionals and a pleasure to work with. Um, and just to remind everybody that this admission to this event includes Big Summer, a novel, and the team there will be working hard to send the books out. So you should be getting your delivery in the next couple of weeks. And that Temple Beth Shalom Sisterhood is working on several other initiatives at this time to work with other local businesses. So keep an eye out. Um, we have our, with our leadership of Adrian Pardo, we're working with uh, our favorite caterer, Michael Meltzer, to do a cooking online class. And so keep an eye out on the weekly Temple Talk to find out what's happening. And thank you guys so much again for what you've done and have a fabulous week, everybody. This was wonderful. Thank you guys. Bye. Bye.